Now, this is a very true observation of yours, and uh, Mrs. Ketke, you have traveled through to many ashrams in India, and you have seen this. Good. The, exist the, the primary purpose or the primary essence of a Guru Chela relationship is based on love, as you said, which is very true and very correct. Now, what happens when a Chela comes to the Guru? The Guru is not always obliged to accept the Chela. Uh, there are many times, and more times, more often than not, where the chela is immediately rejected and the guru says, sorry, I cannot accept you. Because the guru can judge and estimate the qualities that are inherent in the chela. Now, this was the ancient Aryan Vedic system, which existed thousands of years ago. In the modern age, in the modern age, times are different. In those times, in India especially and specifically, uh, there were many, many ashrams, and people were more spiritually inclined. So therefore, there was a greater abundance of spiritual teachers and preceptors. Today, the position has changed as far as that there are not as many ashrams as there were before. Another thing that has happened today is that the population today is far, far greater than what was in those times. So, taking all these things into consideration, taking the rise of extreme materialism in people, today ashrams uh, would just about take on anyone as a chela. Now, the reasons that give you for this is this, that even if the person the chela, although the chela has not the qualification, uh, if he could benefit just a little, then some purpose would be served. We in our organization uh, um, have one maxim, and it is this, that to turn a person into the right direction. We would never promise anyone self-enlightenment in one lifetime or four lifetimes or ten lifetimes. We say self-effort is necessary. You yourself can evolve yourself through proper guidance. And where there is guidance available, then by all means make use of the guidance so that you will evolve. Vivekanand, for example, uses an analogy that as the seed must be good, so the ground too must be well tilled for good fruit to grow, right? So the guru in the form of the seed has to be good. And at the same time, the chela, the ground, also has to till himself well before the tree can grow. Now in this tilling, in this tilling, practical methods are given. Uh, in our case, meditational practices are given. And at the same time, each and every one is told over and over and over again that you must use discrimination. Uh, you must discriminate between right and wrong in your daily living. You must consolidate your actions in such a total manner so that all your actions are not only done with mind and body, but also with that divine energy within you. So your daily actions must be a representation of the total you, mind, body, and spirit. Now this you have to do consciously. And this is told to everyone over and over again. Your meditational practices will give you strength by all means, but that strength has to be re-strengthened by your daily living and daily activity. Good. So that, so that, uh, your meditation and your daily living could work hand in hand and it forms a very, very beautiful circle whereby one strengthens the other. Now, so going back to those ancient Vedic times, one could discriminate and that was a test to jealous that before they approach a guru, they had to prepare themselves. Right. Everyone knew in Vedic times that if you do not prepare yourself, then a guru will not accept you. Those were in Vedic times. 
Today, modern living has become such that even the poor gurus have been reduced to such a state that uh, although they know that such and such a chela is not worthy, is not worthy to be accepted, yet he finds worth in the chela, knowing the modern times, knowing the modern structure of society as it is based, that is so immersed in materialism. And today the Guru is just satisfied, the real Guru, the true Guru, that if I could only ignite one spark in this person's heart. Right. So therefore, you would find chelas coming along that would have so many, many negative qualities. The purpose, as you said, should be pure love and not possessive love. That is very true. But for a person to conceive of and to practice pure love requires very, very great purity. It is the same as saying that if you want to know God, then you become godly. If you want to know purity, then you become pure. So that love would be loving for the sake of love. So that exists, that beautiful divine communion, that energy which exists between Chela and Guru. Good. Now that is, of course, the ideal. But then we have Chelas that have negative qualities and they might develop a possessive love. Now, the possessive love, the Guru also assesses. Nothing goes beyond him. Every flicker, a true guru, a good guru, has the ability to assess even the flicker of the eyelid of Jela and interpret its meaning. Truthfully and beautifully, he would know. But behind it all, he sees the divinity in the person and says, Oh, uh, so why is this person a Jela? Because the person is still not a guru yet. Hmm? The person is still learning. And therefore, a true guru develops or has within him very, very spontaneously all the kindnesses and all the compassion, knowing the weaknesses of the jealous. Good. But behind the weaknesses, he also sees the divinity. Good. Um, someone complained to me that, oh, the servant is not working well. Is not polishing the furniture well or washing the dishes well. So I replied to this person that if the servant girl had your brains, then she would not be a servant. Hmm? So if there was that perfection in the chelas, they would not be needing a guru. So therefore, it is the primary aim of the guru to accept the chela with all his imperfections because it is only the Guru that knows the true quality of love, that knows what true love is. In other words, he accepts the person in the totalness of that person. He does not only see the mind and the body, but he also sees that divine spirit, eternal spirit, that resides within each and every one. So, now we know, uh, going back to your question, that some chelas are possessive. No, this is seen and very openly seen by the Guru. And it's very openly recognized. But the hope is there. The hope is there that this person will better himself. As the person goes deeper and deeper into his or her practices, that person will definitely better himself. So, the Guru is also hopeful and so is the Chela. It is the duty of the Chela to be hopeful too. There comes times where sometimes the guru has to be very hard, right? He'll do some bottom spanking, not only back patting. Huh? Yeah. He has to do this to achieve a certain result. He has to do this. Uh, sometimes the immature chela will not recognize what is done. The immature chela will not know. They, will, uh, they could only see as far as the nose is as the saying goes. But the true guru sees behind corners, knows exactly what effect this spanking is going to have, not only today, not only tomorrow, but for all time to come. What has been stirred up in this chela by doing this? What has been dissolved? Sometimes if you have a boil, 
on your, say your land, you have a boil, you use a medicine to bring the boil to the ripeness. Hmm? Right. Now, bring the boil to the ripeness can be painful sometimes. Oh, yes. But after the boil is ripe and you, you, you prick it hmm, and all the, the, the poisons, the toxins are out, then the, the, the person walks well again. Hmm? There's no problem. So, therefore, uh, movements or, or people that do things on a mass basis have never really been successful as they should be, as, it, as their principles state. Yeah. Therefore, therefore, the relationship is always individual. Always individual. And the Guru recognizes the shortcomings of each and every one. Because if people never had shortcomings, then they would not need the guidance or the study for self protection So, nevertheless, as you said, there should not be possessive love, which is the ideal. Because with possession, with possession, so many other evils are associated. Yeah. Uh, the idea which a guru teaches to people is to avoid the me and mine. And here, possessiveness is the greatest example of me and mine. Hmm? Good. But nevertheless, people progress out of it. People progress out of it where uh, they slowly see that the Guru is not only a man, although he's embodied, but he's a universal spirit. And how can I possess the universal spirit all to myself? They would learn to see that. Because as they advance, they too broaden their horizons. They too start becoming universal, universal, universal. And then the true emergence takes place between Guru and Chela. And all possessiveness then is gone. Good. Now, when Chela start their practices, uh, say someone meditates for three months or six months, a year perhaps, uh, they think to themselves that they have not made any progress. They think that because the subtle qualities evoked in them are not appreciated by their minds. But yet others around them see very easily, ah, such and such is so different now, or such and such is so different now. And all the difference is more apparent to the Guru. And this in turn encourages the Guru to, to pursue. Ah, there is potentiality there. There is, we're not uh, trying to get uh, blood out of a wall. There is potential there and there is progress there. Now, some people want to have self-enlightenment in a day, hmm? and which is a false hope to most of the people, 99% of the people in the world. Even the percentage can be so much higher than that. Yeah, uh, this is achieved, it's a process, it's a process. Some people can achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, others five lifetimes, 500 lifetimes. Fine. But everyone definitely reaches the goal and proper guidance makes them reach the goal quicker. So qualities like possessiveness, for example, or petty jealousies, or little petty squabbles are slowly eradicated slowly eradicated because of the love that is shown by the Guru and shown very, very genuinely and sincerely. These petty squabbles are soon eradicated. But on the other hand, the Chelas too must make some conscious effort to come to an understanding, not only within themselves, but those that are around them. Those, the environment. The, the Guru Bhais or, or Guru Bhans, some understanding must come around and for the sake of the Guru, if, if not for anything else, for the sake of the Guru, petty differences are to be settled. And, and the person says to himself that these petty differences we have, then we are not really worthy of our Guru's love. So what we try to do is settle petty differences. Sometimes we have to sacrifice our own egos. Hmm? And that is what we are after, actually. 
to sacrifice egos. Sometimes we have to undergo these disciplines of subduing our egos for the sake of the welfare of the many. Hmm? So that the, a movement that is started can grow from strength to strength because uh, it is realized by us that the teachings that are given are sincere, beautiful, pure. They are the wisdom of the ages. And we that want to evolve ourselves also must want to see that others evolve too. Because if the environment is conducive, it in turn helps us. You go into a temple or a church, the environment is so beautiful that automatically uh, your mind is more tuned towards meditational practices. Now, who has done this for us? Other people that have prayed in those churches and temples. Other people that have gone to those churches and temples and created this lovely atmosphere. And we have benefited by it. Likewise, we do that also. Where we try and benefit our, the environment so that others could also gain from it. And that is the proper sharing. That is the love that is to be generated. That is the message of Christmas of Christ. The generation of love or the unfoldment of love, as we would say. Good. And for that, for that, no one should ever lose any hope. Man is potentially divine. This I say practically at every talk. And every man, every person can unfold to the maximum limit. And the, and the limit, to use that word, the limitless limit, is the entirety of all existence. You can call it God. Where man, the individual self, becomes the universal self. The small s becomes the big s. Hmm? That, that is achieved. That would be achieved by each and every one. What is happening now with, say, a movement like ours is to awaken this interest. Is to awaken this interest and direct a person along the proper path to bring some understanding to people that this is the path for you to reach your destination. Do not grope around in the wrong direction. And if this is achieved, if this is achieved, then be sure that the person in one lifetime, five lifetimes, 500 lifetimes, will surely reach the goal and more quicker, less painlessly, they will reach the goal because they are trodding the right path, which will take them direct path, straight path, painless path, a path without as many obstacles as another path would have, no potholes, or they might be very few. Hmm? And the car is well tuned by meditational practices, by right living, by self-effort. The car is well tuned and oiled. And plenty of petrol there comes from the divine energy which we gain through our practices. And the car goes smoothly to its goal. Hmm? So like that, like that, all the negative qualities we have, such as pettinesses, pity squabbles, jealousies, um, possessivenesses, they all slowly disappear. They crumble away. They crumble. Away. Hmm? Little, uh, uh, little rivulets, when they merge away into the ocean, then there are no more rivulets. It is the one big ocean. And this is the realization we have to come to. And this is the realization that we all will have, which we must have. Then some purpose is achieved. Then this movement is worthwhile. And I know that this can be done. I know the future step by step for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years to come. If I say these things or else I would not be wasting my time here now hmm? or doing the work I'm doing. I know what the world is heading for, what can be done. I know how people's hearts can be opened, how their minds could be expanded and how the whole tone could be elevated 
towards greater joy and greater beauty and less suffering. We know, we know these things. But cooperation is required. And no hope is ever to be lost. No hope. Because the path of realization is not easy. Do not let anyone promise you miracles to say, ah, overnight you have God realization. There is no such thing. Yes, you have the spark that is within you. What the guru or the good teacher does, he fans it very gently, very smoothly, with love, with wisdom. He fans that spark until you, the chela, become consumed by it. Hmm? That little spark is fanned until it becomes a great big fire and you are consumed in wisdom and in love. So then the Guru's wisdom and love becomes your wisdom and love. You become identified with the love and wisdom of the Guru. Hmm? And then there's no separation. Hmm? Then you don't say, I possess my Guru. You say, I am my Guru. Huh? You see? That's how we develop. That is how we develop. But that is how differences seems. Now, the goal of life is the identification of man with God. The end and aim of life is the identification of man with God. God being abstract. Let us forget him for the moment. Let us find that which is concrete here and now. Let us identify ourselves with one. And then you will see automatically through the one, you are identified with the whole universe. And after identification with the entire universe, you even go beyond it and then observe the little play. So when the Guru sees the jealousies and squabbles and pettinesses of the jealous, he enjoys himself and has a good laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yes. Some evenings I'm sitting and uh, alone to myself of doing some initiations from the various forms that has come from overseas. And I say, oh, that was really beautiful. Wasn't that so nice? The little child huh? was playing so lovely. Everything is lovely. Even the possessiveness or pettiness of the children is lovely to the father. Even the little naughtinesses of your child is lovely to you. Always is. Always is. Because the true Guru does not regard anyone apart from him. Everyone is his own flesh and blood. He cares, he loves, he advises, he guides. Hmm? He kisses, hugs, pats, spanks. The works. Hmm? That means the purpose. And that is my Christmas message to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Who's next? The whole saying is like Shankara, who said that uh, the world that all in it is Maya or illusion, and nothing is what it appears to be. Yes. Can you explain this? Yes, Shankara says that the whole world is an illusion, uh, and nothing is real, it is a dream. Good. Now, that is from the Advaitic philosophy. Advaitism, in other words, monism, which regards that everything to be just a reality. Uh, uh, everything is an unreality, and only divinity is the true reality. Fine. Now, that is very well and very, very true. But from what angle is it true? It is true from the standpoint of Shankara who had reached self-realization. Who had reached self-realization and knowing infinity to him, there was nothing finite. Having become one with infinity, there was nothing finite. Because even in the finiteness of life, he saw infinity. And once, and once, you have such great beauty, then the little beauties disappear. Disappear. Little beauties disappear. Because they disappear not in annihilation, 
little beauties are not annihilated, but they merge away into the greater beauty. So, when we talk of Sankara, we must know the meaning of discrimination. To be able to discriminate between what is reality and what is unreality. And true, proper, and complete discrimination only comes when we reach the stage of Shankara. Because of this philosophy of Maya, I have said this before, more harm has been done than good. Maya, the belief of Maya by the one who has not reached a high stage of evolution can be very harmful. They become predeterministic. They become fatalistic. I have seen families that has uh, the 12 children, hmm? very poor. They can hardly feed two, but they have 12. But that belief of Maya is so ingrained in them. And then I ask, why so many children? You can't, uh, why have 12 when you can't even feed two? Never mind two, you can't even feed yourself. And then they say, it is the work of God. Hmm? I say, work of God? Do you sleep in separate bedrooms? God works in mysterious ways, fine. But you do have to work in less material, mysterious ways. Hmm? Good. Now, what had to happen had to happen. It was ordained. It was predetermined that I must have 12 children. Hmm? You see, there, there comes into play free will and divine will, which we had discussed so many times before. Good. Now, it is very good as idealistic philosophy to acknowledge and to understand the principles of Advaitism or monism, where everything else, all existence is a dream, and the only reality is the Lord. That is very true. But if your wife and children are hungry at home, hmm, can we call that unreal? If you have a headache or a toe ache, can you call that unreal? So it is only when we transcend or go beyond relativity that we can call a relativity unreal. While we are dreaming, that dream is completely real to us. While we are dreaming, it is only when we wake up that we look back and say, oh, what a lovely dream, good dream or bad dream. Then only the realization dawns that all this possessiveness that we had, all this me and mine, all this pettiness was only a dream. So why did I stick to that dream? How could, have, could I have been so foolish to have stuck to such a dream? Hmm? But that comes when we become realized. So Shankara is not to be discarded. Advaitism is not to be discarded. And non-Advaitism or non-Monism is not to be discarded either. While we are still enmeshed in relativity, we must look at all relativity to be real too. And only when we transcend, only when we go beyond the relativity, then we will realize that that all was just a dream. Now I know the essence, because I am the essence, and the essence is real, not the manifestation. The manifesto is real, and not the manifestation. Then, you be, when you become the fire, you do not worry about the heat. But until you have not become the fire itself, then you must be conscious and aware of the heat around you and not discard it as just maya, just uselessness, just dreaming. So, this is not contradictory. Non-dualism 
and dualism is not contradictory as most people believe, as many teachers teach, but one is the extension of the other. One is the extension of the other. That one, when one passes beyond dualism, when one passes beyond dualism, then there is non-dualism. But it is not contradictory. It's a stage. We pass the stages from dualism to non-dualism, from separation to oneness. That is the stage we pass through. And that is the truth, the truth. We find this in the Bible. Christ said the same thing. Christ said to the flock that pray to thy Father in heaven. Hmm? Dualism. Father in heaven and you here. Separate. Dualism. And then to his closest ones, he said, I and my Father are one. Hmm? Non-dualism. Okay. So this is illustrated very well in the Bible as well. And of course, in, in various ancient philosophies. Various ancient philosophies. So while we are still enmeshed in relativity, we can accept the principle of non-dualism, that everything is a dream and there's only one reality. We can accept that principle. But remember, that's an intellectual principle. It is a principle which is analyzed by the mind. The intellect will accept it, that yes, the intellect analyzes it. That is intellectualizing. But what we do practically, practically in the world today, until we reach that stage of realization, we have to accept the separateness. We have to accept the separateness until we progress and go beyond the separation. We have to accept the reality of relativity. That is what I'm trying to say. That even relativ relativity is real because we are enmeshed in it. We are part and parcel of the relativity. Now, intellectualizing about the unrealness of the universe, intellectualizing about the unrealness of the universe, cannot get us anywhere. It is only intellectualizing. What we want is realizing. Not intellectualizing, but realizing. Because the mind too is so finite. And that principle, when everything becomes a dream, everything becomes maya, is when we have reached infinity. When we have become one with the infinite. Until we are still finite, then all that around us that is finite, we accept. And it is because of dualistic philosophies, it is because of this dualism that all these ethical and moral laws are there. Made not only to stabilize society, but also for our personal evolution. Now, if everything is regarded as Maya, then there's nothing wrong for you to go and kill, murder, pillage, rape, hmm? unfaithfulness, insincerities, infidelities. Nothing wrong in that then, if it was just all Maya. Hmm? Yes, but it is real here because we are in the relative. There's a lovely story where a priest was called to perform uh, the ceremony. Good. Now, priesthood in, in, in most countries, in all countries, is a profession. And a profession necessarily one is paid for doing one's work in one's profession. But this priest had some pretensions of being an intellectual. So after performing the ceremony, he gave a long talk on the uh, futility of existence, that all this existence, all this that you possess is of no worth, no value. But what he was trying to do was this. He was using a psychological trick that all this you are possessing is of no use to you. So pay me bigger fees. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. So, 
the, 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 the host at whose place this big yajna was performed, he was a brilliant man. Hmm? The priest said that there's no reality. It is all unreal. Right. Um, so it came for the time for payment. The, the host filled up a little bag, those times, little passes. He filled it with stones and gave it. <laughs> and he gave it. The priest opens this. And he says, uh, what is this? Stones? But you just said, Maharajji, that uh, uh, this money is unreal. Hmm? <laughs> but then, if that is unreal, this too is unreal. I am unreal and you are unreal and you have performed no ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, to come back to Graham's beautiful, beautiful question, that Shankara's ideology is to be accepted, it is a wonderful ideal. But while we are living in this world, we must love our brother as ourselves. We must obey all the moral injunctions of whichever religion, Hinduism, Christianity, Ten Commandments, whatever, they're all good. They're all very good. We have to obey them. We have to respect and love another. Hmm? We have to love and respect another, which means duality. Until one day we reach the non-dualistic state of Shankara, who'll say that I don't need to love you. I am you. I don't need to love myself. I am love. But that's the stage we aspire to, and that's the stage we want to reach. Thank you, lovely question. What did Christ mean when he said to them, I'll oh, use the mark, not a job on salvation, etc. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, none shall find salvation except through me. Good. Now, uh, Jesus never said that, but Christ said it. The difference <laughs> the difference I am trying to point out is this, that not the man, but the spirit. Good. Not the man limited, embodied, limited man, but the eternal spirit that is him. And when Christ says, none shall reach God except through me, it is very, very true. Because we have to reach, all of us, that stage of Christhood before we too can become one with our Father. So that was very good, very true. But could it to your relationship between Chida and Guru? It's similar, it could be regarded as similar. It must be regarded according to... God, it's developed in the Guru. True. This, this, is, this is the concept, as you say, it's the same relationship between Guru and Chela, and this concept is fostered and encouraged and taught by ancient sages and seers in India, in Vedic times, and even today. Even today. Mind you, this is not necessarily uh, acceptable in the Western way of life. And uh, this injunction is never forced upon anyone. It's never forced upon anyone. And the person must slowly, by himself, come to such realizations. In India, if you go, each and every one, the smallest child will tell you that God and Guru is one. They'll tell you that. In India, as you must have heard a million times. Yes. In the West, we can't say. In the West, values are different. Uh, knowledge is different. But uh, what we want is this, that the chela must recognize and, and, uh, and appreciate the teachings, the wisdom, and find the guidance and benefit by it. For the moment, that's good enough. The good, you say our mistake is that we're thinking in the body that was Christ rather than the spirit that resided in his heart. When he says through me, it's True. the spirit of God. So oh, yes, in the body. Yes, yes. And therefore, the same spirit was in Buddha. The same spirit was in Krishna. And yes. It's the same spirit through which we cannot get further. Further, right? Very true. 
Oh, yes. Same, 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 same. The underthinking continues because our credo and everything is so emphasized as the body mm -hmm. that we forget that it's the spirit that we have. The spirit we have to get, yes. I agree with you. I do, is the spirit. And if we still go into far deeper levels of this, then we would even see the spirit permeating in the body. Yes. But that comes at a very high state of evolution, where even the body is regarded as the spirit, and there's no difference between spirit and body. It's not true. Very high, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a very high state. Very high state. Yes. Huh. Anyone else? Do you stay with the union and union gang as a That is Taoism. Uh, these details, you know, you could uh, uh, find from books. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, it'd be better that way. I tell you why. I have reasons for saying this. Um, now, to, to, to give a discourse on Taoism, in other words, to explain you what yin and yang means, I would have to explain you all the principles of Taoism, which any person can find uh, in, in a book on Taoism. Fine. What we always try to achieve is not to acquire knowledge, but to acquire wisdom. Now, I have explained many times the difference between uh, knowledge that is acquired and, and knowledge which is wisdom. Like, I have a very, very sincere chela, somebody so wonderful that I love so much, who says, he says, uh, he says, Bapuji, I am like a donkey with a whole load of books on my back. But I have not realized anything yet. What we are after here is wisdom. So, um, if you read a book on Taoism, right, and you find a point there which cannot be understood, then ask on that point and, and, and ask that now this is said this way, what does it mean? Like your previous question. This is very beautiful. Now, what would this mean? What would it imply? How could it be related to me and that? Or that and that? Yeah. And then the wisdom comes out. You see, uh, what, what we try and impart is not encyclopedic knowledge. Yeah, because these definitions can be found in any encyclopedia, books, libraries, things like that. But the gist, the essence that we can't understand. And the question is only ready. The question is only ready when he studies something and finds something which he cannot understand. So that shows the questioner's readiness. That shows the true desire of wanting to gain, not knowledge, but wisdom. Isn't that the same that the Gita says, be free of the law of opposites? Yes, true. True. Yes, we, yeah. Yin and Yang becomes one. Yin and Yang, to put it very simply, represents the opposite. It's true. It's true. No, you see. Yin and Yang represents the relative and the absolute and how they could be combined together in one complete whole. Therefore, it is in a round circle. That's all. But uh, do, do read that one. It's very interesting reading, reading matter, interesting reading matter. And then come up with some finer points of it. And then we go deeper into that. And try and draw some wisdom from the universe. I have how I how you can help me to spread the message. Yeah, yeah. Now this question has been asked me uh, uh, many times. With our counselors there too, uh, they tell me we find such a great joy working for you, doing the work. They're running these various centers all over. I say, you do not work for me. You work for yourself. You do not help me. You help yourself. And that is exactly what you're doing. You are propagating a truth. And by the propagation of that truth, you come to realize greater and greater depths of that truth. So who are you helping? 
not the teacher. You're helping yourself and you're helping your classmates that are within the world. The teacher, he does not need help. He does not need to achieve, for he has achieved. He does not. You require achieving. You require self-realization. You require self-integration. So, by doing this kind of work, you are helping yourself to achieve self-realization. Because this is also one of the ways. This is also one of the ways to find self-realization. Hmm? So, all these yogas culminate on that point. Learn, study and teach. Hmm? In that way, it is not a movement or the guru that is helped. The really speaking in its essence, but the person himself doing the work is helping himself by gaining greater and greater understanding. And that is why the Bible says, go out and preach the word. Hmm? Does God need preaching? Hmm? No, he does not need to be preached about. Hmm? It does not help God, but it helps man himself by speaking of, of the word of God, he, be, he comes to know God more. This is also a way. Hmm? Also a way. So, a person always helps himself while helping others. A person always helps himself while helping others. If you have found at a supermarket so the price of sugar has gone down by 10 cents, good, you would very gladly tell your neighbors that go to that supermarket, the sugar is less 10 cents per packet. Hmm? Because you have love in you. You have love in you and you'd like to see your neighbor benefit by 10 cents. Good. You like to see your neighbor benefit by 10 cents. So what you are doing now is you are putting that love within you for your neighbor into practice. And by putting that which you find would be beneficial to someone else, by putting it into practice, you will know the greater value of love. And then the love that might have been possessive becomes unpossessive and unselfish. A million pounds of theory is not even worth one ounce of practice. We always say that. So who are you helping there? You are helping yourself by demonstrating in practical life unselfishness and love. Hmm? It was not necessary for you to tell your neighbor that the packet of sugar is 10 cents less at that supermarket. It was not necessary. It was not even expected of you from your neighbor to give this news. But you did it so that your neighbor can benefit. It's an act of love. It's an act of char charity. It's an act of sincerity. It's an act of givingness. It's an act of unselfishness. How much have you not gained by demonstrating the true religion in practical life? So who helps who? Since when or from when do chillers help gurus? It is always the other way around. What do you do if you have developed through chela relationship is to teach the guru's word. And by teaching the Guru's words and his wisdom, you become more firmly established in that wisdom. And that is the process of identification between Chela and Guru. That is also a way to self-realization. To the concrete, from the concrete to the abstract, the absolute. From the relative to the absolute. From the separation to the oneness. So, when we do something 
when we propagate truth, we must never say to ourselves in our minds and in our hearts that I am helping. Immediately you say that you are displaying selfishness. I am helping. I, the ego, great ego, who am I? Immediately ask yourself, who am I that's to help divinity? Your ego is immediately subdued there. So, whatever we can do, whatever we can do is a great help to ourselves and are we also not our brother's keeper? Hmm? Love thy neighbor as thyself? Yes, this is how it is demonstrated. And that is why we do these things. That is why we become unselfish. And this is the way towards unselfishness. Okay. <laughs> so all is done. All is done for our own evolution. All is done for our own evolution. We do not need to help God. God does not need our help. We need His. And by knowing of His principles, knowing the principles of divinity, and practicing them by actively helping others towards those principles, we are helping ourselves. So this is the way in which God helps us. God does not need help from us, but we need His help. And in this way, we draw His help to us. We draw His grace. This is what grace means. Everyone says, oh, give me grace, give me grace, give me grace. <laughs> it is there. <laughs> yeah, it is there. Even Deepa says that too. <laughs> give me grace, yes. Grace is there. But what have we done to get the grace? Hmm? What have we done to get the grace? So, if we can do whatever in our power to propagate, to spread that love and wisdom to all corners of the world, we are helping ourselves and we are drawing unto ourselves divine grace. We are opening the, 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 the door for it just to flood in. Oh, yes. Floods in, floods in. And when we give one, we always get ten in return. That law is undisputable. We get back ten in return in some way or the other. Always, always, always. Unfailingly, unfailing. Okay. <laughs> Good. Anyone else? We still got to wait for the noon gun before we make tea. <laughs> <laughs> Papaji, question about uh, waking, dreaming, and sleeping. Is it possible? Is there necessarily a, a hierarchy indicated by these states? Are you necessarily more aware, say, in this waking state than you would be in a dreaming? Is it possible? So it's, is it possible? Well, waking, be... dreaming, and sleeping. It, it's not a matter of hierarchy where one is more aware in one state than the other. But what it actually means is this: uh, that uh, you are operating on different levels. Mm. It's not a matter of uh, which is a higher state. It's not a matter of uh, of uh, 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 one state being lower and the other state being higher. But you, when you are dreaming, you are operating on a different plane. And when you're waking, you're operating on a different plane. Yes, that's all which it is, really. Nothing is higher and nothing is lower. Well, I have to study this at some time. I see you're reading a book on it. Yes, to read it and we'll go to the no. <laughs> Because when you read a book, when you read a book, um, I used to know an old lady. Um, I used to speak to her, it's a young boy. Then she would say certain things to me, and uh, and illiterate women, uh, but she was very fond of get, you know asking little boys, 
to read to her, and she used to give some sweets. She had this thirst for knowledge. This old woman had this beautiful thirst for knowledge. But unfortunately, she was not sent to school and she could not read or write. I'm referring to someone in India. Fine. So in order to gain some knowledge, she, when she made some, some nice sweet meats in her house for her family, she used to keep some aside. And when a school child passed, this school nearby, and the children had to pass her own. So she used to call this one today, that one tomorrow, and say, will you please come this afternoon or this evening and read a little for me? And the children would gladly go to her because they knew that they were going to get mitai sweets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So uh, one day uh, in speaking to this old woman, um, she told me about, so I went to read for her that particular day, right? Because I knew I was going to get sweets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so she told me something. Then I say, Maji, which means mother. I say, Maji, I don't agree with it. So she says to me, but it is written in that book, in such and such a book. Right. Um, and she had the implicit faith and belief that whatever is written in a book is true. She had that faith. If something is written in a book, then it is true. Otherwise, it's not true. A little woman, but a very wonderful, loving woman. Good. So, likewise, when you read the book on dreaming, good, by all means. But remember, it is the opinion of one man. Mm -hmm. So, after reading the book, then we analyze it. Right. Then we analyze it and see how far that man's thought went. And how furthermore our thoughts can go. Because sometimes the power of analysis exceeds the power of the particular contention. Hmm? The power of analysis can exceed that which has been put forth, the injunction. And that is how we learn. That is how we get acquired knowledge. Hmm? We can also have a lot of books on the back. Hmm. I wasn't thinking that much of, I haven't read the book yet. I have still to read it. So that's why I'm introducing the topic. But I know that it's possible to have a, an experience in the dreaming state, which could be very much more beautiful than the waking. And it could also seem very, very real, as much as being here could seem real. Yes, now that too, that too is a contradiction of terms that uh, uh, in the dream state, a experience is more beautiful than an experience in the waking state or less beautiful. It is a contradiction in the sense that we are uh, not evaluating. We are not evaluating the, 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 the beauty or the incident on the basis of the incident itself. We are evaluating it from a different stance altogether, whereby we have extricated ourselves from the waking experience and the dreaming experience. And we are evaluating that and judging it. Now, that is very good. That is also the process of analysis. That is very good. But then we also have to acknowledge or recognize, that's the word, recognize our limitations. That is my assessment. Correct or incorrect. Now, was that experience in the dream state really better than the experience in the waking state? Was it really beautiful? Hmm? Good. Now, if we reach a stage of spiritual development, whereby we develop the ability to live in the moment, then all comparison cease. Because by living in the moment, whatever the experience, it has to be beautiful. You find ugliness and beauty only because 
only because you are comparing. And when one reaches the state where there's nothing to compare with, then contradiction ceases. Law of opposite ceases. See? So these things must be very deeply thought into the Nunga went. There's one question here is meditation. Which will achieve the most? That in which you just sit quietly, allow your mind to be included, or where you consciously concentrate? Uh, in meditation, in which would one receive the most where one sits quietly or where one concentrates? Now, I will tell you this, that you will achieve the most in the particular practice given to you. That's me. <laughs> I mean, both would lead hard to, to understand. Not necessarily, Amri Bhai, not necessarily because a concentrative practice might be good for one. And, and, and practices that require no concentration might be good for others. So therefore, we always say that we must not have one practice for everyone in the world. Everyone is individual. So the practice best for me is that given to me by my guru. You see, sometimes you might be worried about a thing. And at a moment when your mind is perhaps not even concentrating, something like a flash, yeah. the answer comes to you. Oh, yes. That's why I was asking that question. Yes. Yeah. Which yeah. Again, the, the terms. True, true. Now, this, uh, this applies, it's a very individual matter. It's a very individual matter, and uh, one method could get one further, while another method could get another further. So we cannot lay down a general law. One cannot lay down. But one thing is very true, that to get the answer you want, one must reach that stage of that silence. Yes. yes. And that stage could be reached by one through uh, uh, um, going into certain methods where the silent dawns upon one and the other method whereby you create a silence. There are other methods whereby you, you have a tug of war with silence and noise. Hmm? Now it depends entirely upon the person individually what is needed for that particular person. One person might need the tug of war Good. One person might need pulling, another person might need pushing, another person might need it just dawning on him, hmm? like the, the early morning dew on the grass. Okay. And some person might need a downpour. So, so, so therefore, so, <laughs> so therefore, individual practices. So I would say again, the best practice for a person is the one given to one by one student, always, always. He, he knows his job and uh, uh, he wouldn't give you uh, headache medicines or toe ache. No. <laughs> can, can we give you our Christmas visit to the gym? Yes. Thank you.